Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, editor-at-large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. Job numbers are out again today. It's much the same as last week and the week before and the week before that. More job loss, three million more people today for a total of about 36 and a half million unemployed right now. The projections indicate depression era devastation to the job market. With that, some believe reverting to historical tactics to fight this very difficult economic downturn might be the answer. FDR's New Deal was born from tough times, as were programs like the CCC and the Tennessee Valley Authority. These public works initiatives didn't just provide jobs, they also buoyed infrastructure and modernized American lives with power grids, with roads and bridges. One thing is true, we will have to rebuild in some ways. Now, something similar to FDR's New Deal is being proposed, but with a clean energy twist, focusing on a low carbon future. Dr. Ernest Moniz is a nuclear physicist who served as United States Secretary of Energy under President Obama. He is now President and CEO of the Energy Futures Initiative. Dr. Moniz, thank you so much for joining us today. In the pages of The Hill, you recently wrote about the need for an energy jobs coalition, particularly in that time. And I, I looked at the number. At that time, the unemployment uh, level was 10 million. As of today, it's 36 million. So if you made your point then, it's probably triple so now. Tell us what you're talking about. You're right, Steve. And in fact, uh, it might be worth just noting that in the clean energy sector specifically uh, with the new job numbers, uh, what we've seen is a reduction of about a sixth in the clean energy jobs in the country, uh, frankly, wiping out uh, uh, by a factor of two uh, all of the job increases of the last three years. Uh, so this is obviously a very, very serious situation. Uh, and we are seeing throughout the economy not only liquidity problems, but solvency problems. All of that means uh, our recovery has really got to get focused on creating lots of new jobs. Well, over the last five years, the job creation in the energy sector, as we wrote in the Hill, uh, has really outpaced the economy by a factor of two in terms of job creation. We also need to, to really move along, in fact, pick up the pace on accelerating uh, the transition of the energy economy to low carbon. And so let's put those two things together. Uh, as we climb out of this economic hole, uh, let's put uh, uh, resources into not only meeting immediate needs, but in terms of creating the kinds of clean energy jobs uh, that will have such high leverage uh, in adding to the total job numbers while uh, moving us on the direction that we want to go anyway uh, in terms of clean energy. You may recall that the last time I had dinner with you was the Calorama conversation at the um, uh, home of the French ambassador. It's not, you know, it was, it was nice. But Daniel Jurgen was there, uh, a great energy expert. And Dan Jurgen said that night that a collapse in demand for oil was gonna, you know, change the entire energy picture. And I'll never forget that. And, I, and we talked briefly about what those dynamics would do to the economics for the fossil fuel industry and what that would do for the renewables. Can you share with us, now that we've seen such a collapse of demand uh, for oil and gas, does that, does that hurt or harm uh, the renewable energies picture? Well, first of all, in terms of the oil sector itself, uh, Steve, I think uh, it's worth noting that uh, demand, of course, will start coming back uh, once the economy is reopened. But I agree with Dan, uh, Dan Jurgen, uh, that frankly, we are going to see, I think, some uh, permanent structural changes uh, in, that, in that industry. And uh, those structural changes were being called for before the virus uh, because of the structure of the American uh, oil industry, uh, which was not exactly managing a great cash flow. Uh, and so uh, as we come back, uh, it's the same theme I just mentioned. Uh, not all of those jobs, frankly, uh, are, are going to be there. So we need to think ahead. For, for example, we should be doing right now a very, very strong carbon capture and sequestration uh, program hmm. uh, to, to, uh, to make sure carbon is not going into the atmosphere. But if you think about those jobs, uh, putting large amounts of carbon dioxide underground, it's the same skill set uh, as in the oil industry. So that's a good example as to how a coherent view of how, the, how that sector revolves can actually be good from the job perspective as well. Now, from the renewables uh, side, 
I think it's mixed, and I think we'll we'll the school is out in terms of how it'll turn out. On the one hand, it's clear that things like collapse in fossil fuel prices historically uh, have uh, diminished. Uh, the enthusiasm for uh, some of the uh, transition, uh, whether it's to uh, wind and solar or or electric vehicles, uh, for example. But on the other hand, I think that the reliability of those renewable sources really has to be in people's mind, as we have seen this extreme volatility uh, in the uh, in the fossil fuel uh, industry, specifically in the, in the oil industry. So I think in the end. Uh, there's a little bit of near-term uncertainty, but in the longer term, uh, I feel very, very bullish that we will continue the low-carbon transition. We will continue to see not only renewables, but carbon capture and sequestration and nuclear power and low-carbon fuels, uh, maybe hydrogen, uh, on which I'm also very bullish, uh, all coming together uh, for a uh, low-carbon system that in fact will be effective in supporting uh, a strong uh, jobs base. Mr. Secretary, when we um, have talked previously, when we did the opening of this show today, we talked about the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, you look back in the 1930s at the CCC, the Works Progress Administration. From what you've seen thus far, and you talk to folks on both sides of the aisle, do you find there's an appetite to be thinking big along those terms so that the ideas you're suggesting actually uh, have fertile ground um, when it comes to some of the stimulus packages that are being conceived? Well, I think, uh, frankly, the threads have not all yet come together into a beautiful uh, tapestry, but uh, uh, but I think there is certainly a lot of interest uh, uh, in the Congress. Um, uh, in fact, my colleagues from EFI did a hearing, uh, a quasi-hearing, a video uh, briefing, really, uh, with uh, members from both sides of the aisle present in the House. Uh, so I think the the Congress is grappling with this. But as you know, just yesterday, uh, the chair of the Fed uh, made the point that uh, we are going to have to need uh, substantial more uh, uh, work from Congress uh, in terms of putting some funds into the economy. And as we discussed earlier, uh, I certainly think that uh, this direction in clean energy uh, does have historical precedent, as you said, uh, in the uh, in the uh, depression, for example, where fundamentally both things like big hydro power uh, and getting uh, electricity to every house in, in America uh, were part of that. Mm. Uh, in the Recovery Act of 2009, we again had some very, very important foundational work done uh, in moving uh, the energy economy forward uh, with new infrastructure, uh, new big solar farms and the like. Uh, and now I think we need the same thing. And I, and I think Congress uh, will be coming, uh, coming to this uh, in, a, uh, in a at least reasonably bipartisan way. Um, if you were to focus in on the two or three most obvious and biggest initiatives that could be done in the energy place so that lay people could understand how to prioritize them. What would be uh, at the top of your list in terms of having a program like this? Well, uh, one obvious area is energy efficiency. I mentioned earlier uh, that we've lost about a sixth of clean energy jobs in total uh, over March and April. Uh, well, about two thirds of that job loss was in energy efficiency. Uh, because uh, we sometimes forget that a large part of energy efficiency are construction projects that go on in mm. in residences and, and buildings. Well, right now, uh, we could be really making a big push there, uh, maybe not so much in residences quite yet, uh, while we still have uh, at least a large part of the population uh, uh, at home, uh, but businesses, small, medium-sized businesses, public buildings, uh, these are all buildings where even during the virus, we have large parts of the day where there are no or very few people around. And so construction projects could go forward, efficiency projects. That's an example of a big push that would have permanent, uh, permanent benefits uh, and could be done and put people to work uh, uh, at the same time. Now, another area that I did already mention is that for which there is bipartisan support. Uh, I believe that uh, in addition to renewables, uh, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, as I said, is going to be very, very important. There's a lot we could do right now. The Congress, in a bipartisan way, uh, has provided some tax credits, major tax credits, 
uh, for projects that start before 2024. Uh, uh, I would put a, a note in that the IRS uh, needs to finish providing the guidance for the use of those tax credits, but that's a clear manifestation of uh, an important low carbon direction, uh, one that uh, can be pursued uh, in many places right now, and as I stated earlier, would have a very uh, salutary uh, effect in terms of uh, jobs uh, for those in the oil industry who are suffering major dislocations. I mean, just so those so, are just two examples. Yeah, just I, so I, I can made. understand the science um, of this, is carbon capture and sequestration, is the science fixed there or do you need more developments? Because the last time I spoke to you about this, uh, which was several years ago, uh, we still needed to make more advancement. Where is the science of carbon sequestration uh, and capture now? Well, uh, in terms of capturing the carbon dioxide that's being emitted from power plants or from industrial facilities, uh, now over the last several years, uh, there have been in the United States and elsewhere, uh, many uh, large scale projects. Large scale means uh, typically a million tons of CO2 or more per year. Uh, now, the costs have come down as uh, that's happened. We need more cost reduction. But again, that will come as the as the area uh, scales up and perhaps uh, new uh, technologies for capture also uh, evolve. On the sequestration side, uh, I think we know a lot about the geology. Uh, we have vast capacity for uh, storing carbon dioxide uh, deep underground. Uh, we do, however, need to catch up in terms of regulatory procedures, uh, liability uh, uh, issues being being resolved, many of these at the state level. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, frankly, there's no doubt that we could move out right now. We have big projects going on in Texas and Illinois. Uh, we are working to uh, uh, try to promote uh, the uh, some projects going forward soon in California. Uh, in fact, in one of the studies we did, uh, Steve, at the Energy Futures Initiative, uh, we published this last year on California's pathways uh, to meet its low carbon goals. We pointed out that by 2030, uh, getting some carbon capture and sequestration going is practically essential uh, for them to meet the 40% economy-wide emissions reduction goal that is on the books. It's a, it's a law in California. So really getting moving on that quickly uh, is, again, another great uh, opportunity, I think, right now uh, as we dig out of this uh, virus-induced uh, economic hole Let me and ask meet, our carbon, meet our carbon requirements, which is going to be another, after all, <laughs> major threat to society if we don't. In our last couple of minutes, just, just in, in, I want to ask you a, kind of a political question. Um, I interviewed your successor, Rick Perry, former governor of Texas, uh, when he was Secretary of Energy. And uh, uh, the governor took pride in the level of emissions reductions in Texas. And I asked him kind of facetiously, are you allowed to say that publicly? Because in, the, in his administration, uh, there you know, is an aversion to using the words climate change. There's a skepticism of science about this. There have been uh, policies that have deregulated in ways that favor the fossil fuel industry. What kind of appetite, well, but Rick Perry was in favor of his you know, emissions that he had achieved in, in, in Texas. So I'm interested in whether or not you're finding an appetite across both aisles for the work of EFI and on this larger message that, let, that less carbon in our energy infrastructure and future um, is something that can work. And, and, and your comments on at least some people in town in Washington, D.C., not sharing that particular view. But is, is there an appetite, particularly on the Republican side, uh, for some of the messages you're sharing? Uh, I believe there is. Uh, certainly, we've been, we've been getting very good, very good receptions uh, with, what, with our, our framework, which we call the Green Real Deal, uh, uh, moving forward. But I also want to remind you, Steve, it's not only at EFI. When, when I was uh, a secretary at, at the Department of Energy, uh, with my colleagues, not only at DOE, but across the government, uh, we produced uh, what was called the Quadrennial Energy Review, hmm. two volumes looking at uh, ener uh, energy infrastructure needs and specifically electricity needs. Those were very, very well received. Uh, that was a Republican controlled Congress uh, and yet uh, 20 plus of the recommendations uh, in the uh, Quadrennial Energy Review were put partially or totally into law, uh, not, just, not just discussed in the committee, but put into law. 
So I think the idea of uh, while while the climate change words are uh, sometimes uh, de-emphasized, if you like, uh, in the discussions, uh, the solutions to climate change, I think, have uh, great, great support uh, on uh, on both sides of the aisle, especially when we continue what was the Obama administration uh, mantra. The president many, many times used the words all of the above, meaning that it's renewables and storage, but it's also things like carbon capture and and nuclear power uh, and uh, uh, advanced biofuels, uh, many, many options uh, for going to low carbon while completely serving uh, the needs of our of our energy economy uh, and doing so economically. Uh, and I keep emphasizing uh, with very, very strong uh, uh, contributions to building the employment base uh, in this country. Well, we will leave it there. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you. I would say just in closing, I interviewed recently Congressman Will Hurd, a Republican congressman from Texas, and he said, you know, Steve, we need to get beyond talking about recovery and talk about advancing the American economy. And I think this falls very much in that track. Thank you for your sharing your ideas on one big idea on how to do that. We look forward to talking to you again down the road. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. I'm Steve Clemens, be well.